I'm Dr. Jason Saunders, and today we're gonna to talk about breathing. We've done a lot of videos on hyperbaric oxygen and all the different things that hyperbaric oxygen can help with and the benefits of doing hyperbaric over periods of time. But we really never spoke about why we do hyperbaric and how important breathing actually is. And ultimately, why do we breathe? The short answer obviously is just we breathe because we need to get oxygen. But I wanna talk about all those details in a little bit more depth so that we fully understand why we breathe, how we deliver oxygen, and ultimately, that's the beginning of the story of why hyperbaric works and why it's so important to be using it for a variety of different things that we uh, ultimately choose to apply hyperbaric oxygen for. Every cell in your body, except for red blood cells, requires oxygen for optimum function. And every different cell type that we have has a different requirement for energy. Certain cells like adipose tissue or fat cells, they don't require a whole lot of energy, ATP, cellular energy in order to function properly. Whereas let's say a brain cell or a kidney cell or a liver cell, they need a lot of energy in order to function properly. And this whole process of the cells making their own energy, making ATP, is a term called metabolism. Metabolism is a chemical process that the body uses to break down the fuel source and ultimately oxidize our fuel in a series of steps in order to make energy, in order to make the ATP necessary for normal cellular function. So all of these processes of metabolism are oxidative, meaning they require oxygen. And a lot of times when I'm lecturing, I compare part of our cell to an engine, specifically the mitochondria of our cell are the engines of our cells. And just like an engine, the engine needs to suck in air for the purposes of oxygen. And when it sucks in air, it also brings fuel into that mixture. And so it's mixing fuel and oxygen, and it goes through a series of steps that ultimately leads to combustion. In a cell, the process of metabolism is the breakdown of fuel and oxidizing it for energy. But in an engine, we call that combustion. As a result of combustion, there's power generated, there's heat generated, and of course there's exhaust, which actually, if an engine worked you know, efficiently as it could, the exhaust would primarily be carbon dioxide and water. Of course, we know that cars also release carbon monoxide as well, but that's from incomplete combustion. So uh, an engine requires oxygen, it requires the proper fuel, it then creates combustion that generates the power generates the heat and, and the exhaust, and then we get rid of the carbon dioxide and the water. And in our mitochondria, it's literally the exact same process or very similar. Our cells, you know, we eat food, but we eat food ultimately to break it down into its most basic component, which is really, to simplify things, uh, NAD. So once we get NAD into the cell, into the mitochondria, we then go through a series of oxidative pathways, breaking it down further and, and shifting the chemistry inside the mitochondria. And that's what allows us to create power, ATP. But just like we bring fuel in, we bring oxygen in, we then create the power, we create the ATP inside of our cells. We then have waste products, some of which are lost in heat, and then the rest would be carbon dioxide and water. And so very, very similarly, the process of metabolism and the process of combustion is the systems that we use in order to create the power or the energy that a cell requires for normal function. But it's not like we can just, you know, automatically pull oxygen from the air and stick it inside of our mitochondria. It actually has to go through a whole series of steps. We bring it into our lungs. We then have gas exchange that occurs from our lungs into our capillary system. Our red blood cells then need to pick up that oxygen, bind to it at the lung level, and then carry it throughout the whole rest of our body until it gets to our cells, where it can then deliver the oxygen to our cells. And eventually that oxygen can migrate from the outer cell into the mitochondria, where it's then processed for energy. That's a whole process that the body has to go through. And we've developed very specific steps along the way in order to do that. And basically what we've done is we've created uh, little cells called red blood cells. And red blood cells are very unique. They're completely different than every other cell in our body. They're smaller than other cells. Uh, they lose their nucleus as they become red blood cells. 
They're unable to synthesize proteins. They have a 120 day lifespan and their entire life is dedicated to the process of floating through circulation and helping with gas exchange, going up to the lung level, saturating themselves with oxygen, holding that oxygen all the way up until it gets to the cellular levels again, and then releasing that oxygen, picking up carbon dioxide, which was part of that waste product we were talking about earlier, picking up the carbon dioxide from cellular respiration, from the production of ATP, and then carrying that carbon dioxide back up to the lungs so we can exhale it and get rid of those waste products. And believe it or not, that entire process of saturating red blood cells, holding the oxygen throughout our whole circulation up until the point where it knows, okay, here it's time to deliver that oxygen. That entire process is governed through pressure and pressure gradients, allowing the gradients to be the deciding factor, if you will, which way gases are going to move and when and why and how much. That process is ultimately governed through a law called diffusion. Diffusion is the passive transport virtually of anything, of gases, of liquids, but it's basically the passive transport in this case of oxygen and any gas will move from high concentration to low concentration. That's the passive movement of diffusion. As the oxygen content outside in our environment is higher than the oxygen content in our deoxygenated blood that's returning back to the lungs, there's a pressure gradient that's moving oxygen from our lung tissue down its concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration until it gets to the capillaries. As red blood cells come by, there's a pressure associated with that gradient and the pressure inside that area is higher than the pressure of oxygen on the red blood cells. And that's what allows the saturation of red blood cells to occur as red blood cells are moving through circulation and passing by the lung. That pressure is then held the entire way through circulation until it gets to the cellular level. And now the pressure of oxygen on the red blood cell is higher than the pressure of oxygen inside a working cell. And now there's a new pressure gradient, which is allowing oxygen to literally leave circulation in its high concentration form and move passively right into the cell, which is a lower pressure of oxygen. And that gradient system continues to move as long as cells are metabolizing oxygen and ultimately making ATP, there's always a lower uh, pressure of oxygen at the cellular level than there is you know, in the capillary. And so as long as we get circulating uh, normal levels of oxygen in our, in our red blood cell, there's always this gradient that allows the uh, oxygen to passively move from circulation back into the cell. And then the cycle continues over and over again. And literally right now, you know, I'm at sea level, there's a pressure, there's a pressure of my environment and that's called the atmosphere. And at sea level, it's literally, we measure it as one atmosphere. You could also say it's 14.7 PSI. And that's the exact right amount of pressure to allow for a hundred percent saturation at the red blood cell um, when it gets back to uh, passing through the lung tissue. At sea level, when we have just the right amount of pressure, we're fully saturating. We're getting about 100% saturation of oxygen at our red blood cells, which is the amount that we need technically for optimum function uh, under most circumstances. We know that as pressure decreases, in other words, as you, let's say, fly to Denver or you know climb a high mountain, what we realize is that it's harder to breathe at altitude than it is to breathe at sea level. And the reason for that isn't that there's less oxygen percentage. In other words, air is 21% oxygen, whether you're at sea level or at the top of a mountain. The difference is there's less pressure. As we ascend up in altitude, we lose pressure. And because we lose pressure, we lose that gradient, which is the driving force for absorbing oxygen in the first place. The opposite is true as we go uh, below sea level, let's say to increase pressures, now we have a larger gradient, a larger driving force of oxygen into our body, and that allows us to absorb even more oxygen uh, when we breathe. And so ultimately, the limiting factors for how we absorb oxygen is how much pressure are we being exposed to? What percentage of oxygen are we being exposed to? And of course, 
you know, the ultimately the health of our red blood cells, our hemoglobin levels, you know, all of those things as well. But through hyperbaric, we are actually able to manipulate the pressure and the percentage of oxygen very effectively in order to help massively increase the amount of oxygen being absorbed into our plasma and then ultimately delivered to our cells. And that's really where a lot of the difference between hyperbaric, let's say, and, and other oxygen therapies. I'm a huge proponent of EWOT, of ozone, even just of other breathing techniques or breath, breath holding techniques, um, breath work overall. Most of us do not have as efficient of a oxygen absorption system as we could. Most of us don't have as efficient of an oxygen delivery system as we could. And so as we manipulate breath work and breath holds, and then as we get exposed to different modalities that have, you know, different intensities of activity or different types of oxygen in different amounts, we can really have a positive impact on red blood cell health. And then, of course, on the ability to absorb oxygen and the ability to deliver oxygen to the cell. Ultimately, oxygen being delivered to the cell is one of the most critical states of healing and recovery that we can help to create. With hyperbaric, that's one of the main uh, mechanisms by which this all works. In the next handful of videos, we're going to go through some of the basics of hyperbaric mechanisms to really explore the details of exactly uh, how hyperbaric is doing this and, and, uh, and why it's so important. So I look forward to that and uh, thanks again for your attention.